at this time, we'd like to welcome all those that are joining us online now. We're glad that, uh, that you're with us here this day, and I pray that, you, that, that everything is going well with you. If we can help you or be, uh, help you in any way, please do not hesitate to call us or let us know or email us. We certainly do want to minister to you in any way that we possibly can. We're glad to have each of those that are here in our sanctuary, but also those that are online. So we want to welcome you. And now we're going to begin our worship now with music, if we may. Carolyn, please come.
we sing hymn number four in your hymnal, <clears throat> To God Be the Glory.
this time Children's Church is going to be dismissed if you'd like to use that ministry program. Good to be in God's house, isn't it? Good to be together. It's good to worship our Lord. It's good to say the word, sweet Jesus. Because Jesus Christ is the only entity, Lord, that can change things in your life and in my life. He's all powerful. I think as, as we begin in Sunday school, I slipped in here. With, I think he, he, he began talking about Jesus. How do you describe Christ? One of the books that Max Licato writes uh, about, uh, I can't recall which one it was, 2007, in one of the Middle Eastern countries. I won't go into too much detail other than to tell you. As you know, Christianity was certainly indeed in that part of the world, as, as it is in many parts of the world, is in a minority. A pastor where they're meeting in uh, homes and uh, they happen to have an, a place that, whether it was an, uh, an official office or not, this pastor happened to be out of uh, town for a period of times and uh, those that would uh, do him harm, uh, they uh, put his place under surveillance. They waited till this, uh, this pastor came back to this office place. They had cameras there, and a uh, gunman came in and gave them one option, renounce Christ or die. There was four or five there in the office, only one survived and they did not intend for that one to survive. None would renounce Christ. In fact, the words go like this. As death surrounded that whole place, the interior there, the words that were being echoed as life was going out of these three victims was Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. You look on the front of the bulletin, there. High intensity, boldness. I want to ask you a question. What changed in the life of Peter and John and the disciples? from the time they were in Gethsemane. I won't take time for us to go back, but uh, to help you recall there, and I know you remember uh, what the events that happened there when the Sanhedrin court had brought uh, uh, soldiers there, and they would take, uh, they were with the intent, and they were going to take Jesus to put him on through the mockery of a trial. And you remember one of the events that was there, Peter was very brave, uh, you remember Peter drew out his sword. Remember he cut off uh, uh, the ear of one of the servants of the high priest. That didn't sit too well with the high priest, with Caiaphas, as you can imagine. But I can just about assure you, and I've had classes that assure us that Peter was not aiming for the ear. He was aiming for something else. There was going to be greater harm to that person. But you remember what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did? He told Peter, put the sword away. And he reached up and he healed the servant. The one that was coming there to do him harm, and Jesus knew full well what was ahead. And you remember what happened with the disciples? One had already forsaken Christ. In fact, he would be the very one that sold Jesus down in the country for... 30 pieces of silver. Couldn't live with himself. And that silver no, never uh, benefited him whatsoever. He tried to give it back. 
Remember what happened with the disciples? They were scattered. They ran. We can't throw too many stones. I wonder about our bold faith. But I want to talk about here just weeks after this. After Jesus was crucified, he stayed here 40 days, and then he told them to go back to Jerusalem and wait for Pentecost, for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Their life was going to be changed in a way and fashion which they never could have imagined. Oh, they had glimmers of, of what was just ahead. When the 70 went out, they came back so excited, they came back scared to death when Jesus sent 70 out. But they were scared to death when they, when they left, when they came back. They said, Lord, you, can't, you, can't, you just can't believe what was happening. The devil's obeying. We're seeing people that are sick and maimed healed in your name. You see what a difference a little time made in their lives. But now we're seeing the lives of these disciples, particularly Peter and John. Here they were. Now, Peter did muster up a little bit of courage that later on, after he had forsaken the Lord, and he did follow from a distance, and he did come back to see, kind of see what was going on. We kind of picture Peter standing around the, uh, the campfire, and then he gets pointed out and said, you're one of them. This is where Peter said, others are going to deny you, Lord, but I won't. But Peter was going to deny that the Lord not once, not twice, but three times before the rooster crowed. And that, and I'll promise you, their Heavenly Father controls everything. He controlled that rooster crowing at just the right time. God's always on time, folks. In your life and my life, and he was, in, he was always on time in the disciples' lives. I'll promise you that. So, uh, you can look in your bulletin there, but I'm going to, uh, if you've got your Bible, though, let me encourage you to turn with me to Acts, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read a little prior to that here. And uh, Acts, the fourth chapter, and I'm going to read a little bit further, and, and uh, we'll, uh, we may not get finished here, but I want us to start. I'm going to start in verse 1, if you, I'll give you a chance to turn. And I want to ask you that question, what changed? Persecution happens. Peter and John can tell you that. Uh, here we're seeing, and we're going to see here, the first three chapters of Acts. Wonderful. Thousands were saved, were added to the church, to believers. Uh, but then comes chapter 4. Peter and John had healed a man. And up comes the Sanhedrin court, the Caiaphas and Annas, his uh, father-in-law. We see them come on the scene. Look with me at verse 1. I'm reading out of King James, 4th chapter of the book of Acts. And as they spake unto the people, this is Peter and John, the priest and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, listen to what, uh, the, how the scripture, how Luke writes, came upon them. This would not be a, an easy sight to behold. Because the last time they had had this encounter was going to be when they took Jesus. And the disciples, everyone knew exactly what had happened. But something different had happened to the disciples. They were not the same men they were just weeks earlier. Look at verse 2. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached it through Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Now, Sanhedrin court, the leaders of the temple, the high priest, very grieved, very distraught of what Peter and uh, John were teaching and preaching. You see, they had devised that plan and they thought, we have, we're done with Jesus of Nazareth. No more. Three Roman spikes and an old rugged cross Finished him. Now we're just mopping up with all these others that call themselves believers. They had no idea how God had empowered not only Peter and John, but others that were followers. Being empowered with the presence 
of God himself in the, and through the Holy Spirit. Now look with me at verse 3. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Seems like history was repeating itself, no, no doubt probably with Peter and John. But they knew that there was something else left in their arsenal that was going to be far greater than what they had weeks earlier. And that was the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That they were different people. They acted different. They spoke different. They walked different. Look at verse 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about, how many? 5,000 people came to know Jesus Christ Wow. We'd already seen other thousands, others that had come into the fellowship of believers. But now these men, with their determination of doing what God has called them to do, of healing in the name of Jesus, and of speaking the word of Christ, and of proclaiming Christ as Lord, the only one. Just as the illustration I gave a little while ago, when these men were given their lives in the name of Christ, and they were not going to denounce Jesus and, and offer up themselves to a false god or a false deity in no fashion, even if it meant they were not going back home that night. And they were going to cry out as their last words upon this earth was going to be Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. You see, whenever you've been with Jesus, and I'm not talking about that you're just walking with him. You see, walking with Jesus didn't save the disciples. Walking with them and those people that stood from afar and looked at Jesus, that didn't save them. You've heard me time and time again say you've got to have a relationship with Christ. You've got to walk with Christ. And it can't be just mentally. You know, one of the things as, as, we were, as we were talking during the Sunday school hour, you know, I think God's got to start with that heart and soul. It's got to be changed, folks. When that heart and soul's changed, it'll change your way of thinking. It'll change your mind. It'll change you mentally. Look with me now as we're going to begin seeing a little further in verse 5. And it came to pass on the morrow. In other words, it was evening, and they took and they held Peter and John in custody. So tomorrow had come that the rulers and the elders and the scribes, those that felt like they were it, they were better than other people. You talk about no respect for people, right there is it. And look at verse 6. Ananus, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, they were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they set them out there on public display. They wanted everybody to see and they wanted to publicly humiliate them and to downgrade them as much as they humanly could. They wanted to make a spectacle of Peter and John. That's what they wanted to do. We see that even in today's world. We see people that are pouring out the things. Jesus would even tell us, say, you know, sometimes there's a speck in your eye, but there's a two four in yours, and yet you're going to point that speck out. I've held up a piece of paper here before this congregation and others, and a dot here, and I say, what do you see? Well, what you see, I see a black dot. And yet there's, there's a whole lot more white on that piece of paper than there was that dark spot, that ink spot. It's easy to do if we're not careful. So we've got to be cautious. And here, what they were putting these two out there in the midst. Now look at verse uh, 8, if you would. Uh, let's back up verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power and by what name have you done this? Now I want to, I want to draw your attention to this for a very specific reason. They wanted to make their case. They wanted to be the prosecutor. 
of these two. They wanted to show all that were there and, and rest assured they were ears listening to what was going on in these men's lives. See, they put them in the midst to humiliate them, but also to make the case. What, by what power are you doing these things? They had just healed this man. And this man's life was changed forever into a wonderful thing. But yet, here in verse 7, it says, by what power? But that, just the power was not going to be enough. They said, I want you to say it by what name? I want you to identify what, who is, what's the driving force in your life and what's going on. Little did they know, they really did not want to know. For Peter and John, they were different people than when they encountered them in Gethsemane. No longer was Peter and John and the other disciples, no longer were they going to cower. And no longer were they going to run. No longer were they going to be the ones that were going to be weak. See, they were changed. Pentecost had come. The Holy Spirit had come. They had seen thousands coming to the saving knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. Lives had already been changed. People were being healed in the name of Jesus by the power. And they knew exactly what they were doing. You see the setup? They were masters at manipulation. And they worked, they were once again, just like they'd done weeks earlier in the fake mockery of a trial of Jesus, they were working the crowd. Let's look a little further now. Verse 8. Then Peter, what's the next few words there? What's the next phrase there? What were they filled with? The Holy Spirit. Folks, the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. You want to live your life in the power that you and I, that God intended for you and I to live in, you better, you better, you better not try to walk this old world and this thing called life alone. You better have that relationship and that commitment with Jesus Christ, and you better open up your heart and life and say, Jesus, come into my soul, come into my heart, and you live by his power and in his presence. That's a difference maker. That high octane, as we put it in the bullet here, high intensity, boldness. These men were changed. These men were different than what they once were. And look now as we continue, continue reading verse 8. You rulers of the people and elders of Israel. You see, Peter turned it right back around. They wanted to know what power, what name that they were doing the things that they were doing. And Peter identified them. He said, look at the last part here, verse 8. He said, I'm going to identify you. You are the ones that proclaim to be the rulers of the people. And you are the very ones here that he's talking about. You are the elders of Israel. Now listen to verse 9. Listen to the boldness that Peter's speaking to them. Now he's standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the very ones that he had ran from. And I will guarantee you that Caiaphas has had a little a little indignation and probably a little more than a little for Peter because Peter had, tried, had done harm to his servant. He had cut off his ear even though Jesus healed it. I'll guarantee you that was simmering in the back of his mind. You know, it's easy sometimes for you and I to say, I forgive, but I'll dare, I dare say that uh, Caiaphas still had that in his heart. And he really had it out for Peter as well as any believer. Continue reading here. Listen, listen to continue reading. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the infinite man, by what means he is made whole. In other words, if you're going to look, and this is what you're going to be judging us on today, can you hear the intensity? Wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on the wall? You know, the other night we saw a fly on one of the debates. There, and I think it's made it's, made its rounds, uh, probably gone viral uh, online. And uh, uh, we saw one of the candidates there with a fly swatter uh, there. You know, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall when Peter was standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Sanhedrin court there, with the high priest? And here he was, and he's saying, if this is what you're going to judge him, goodbye. Listen to verse 10. Be it known unto who? You and all. In other words, Peter wasn't leaving anybody out. He said, any of you that are listening, 
I want you to know this. Look at verse 10. In the middle part as we're reading. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now listen to what Peter's now. He's going to get a little personal. Whom ye, you crucified. You see Peter now once again he's saying this. He's pointing the finger back at him. You did it. You're the one that came. You and your servants came. You came to Gethsemane. You came at night time, afraid to, to take Jesus during the day. And you came and you took Christ. And you put him through the mockery of a trial. And you beat him beyond almost recognition. And you forced him to carry a cross until his body and the flesh would not carry it any longer. And you would snatch another out of the crowd and compel him to carry the cross the rest of the way. You see, Peter pointing his finger said, you did it. They weren't too pleased with what Peter and John were saying. Let's look a little further. Whom God raised from the dead. Now this really was a real sticking point with them. You remember the great pains that they went to end Jesus of Nazareth? To end any thought or any doubts of what, was, what had happened that he had died. That's really what they wanted everyone to believe. Jesus is dead. That's it. They've gone so far that they commissioned, they got the Roman government to seal the, around the massive stone and to place guards there. What they didn't take into account that God's all powerful and that a stone and a seal, a Roman seal, could not hold Jesus Christ. That when it was time for Christ to come forth from that tomb, he came forth, folks. And because he came forth, today you and I, we are beyond any doubt, we can stand firm on knowing Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior of our lives, not just knowing about Jesus, but knowing him, that you and I, we don't have to worry. For Christ, he's Lord. He's my Savior. He provides the grace that I need to provide forgiveness of all my sins. What a God we serve. The choir sang a little while ago, sweet Jesus, oh Jesus. And as those men in 2007, as their life was getting ready to be taken, and I'll guarantee you they knew what was going to happen because the knives were there, the guns were there, and they knew that sudden death was going to come. But yet they would say, no, I will not denounce Christ. I will not say no to Jesus because I've been with Jesus because Jesus is with me. And they would cry out to him as their life was going forth. What kind of faith and what kind of boldness do we have in 2020 as ourselves? Folks, I think it's a time in which that every one of us need to speak boldly. We need to live boldly for Christ. We need to be the ones that are being challenged right where we're at to do and to live as Christ has given to us. Listen now as it continues on. Whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And they had the man that had been healed. And they stood him up as a mockery and said, hey. And you know, Peter just simply said, hey. This man right here, he's healed because of Jesus. You and I, we've said many times there are times and opportunities in all of, your, all of our lives that Jesus has intervened and on our behalf and Jesus has made a difference in our lives that maybe we have failed to acknowledge him. Folks, I want every man, woman, and child here today to acknowledge that he's Lord and that Christ has done and is doing things for me and for my family that I need you to say, like we begin the service today, thank you, Lord. Give thanks. Give thanks to Jesus. Give thanks to the Lord for what he's doing. Look at verse 11. This is a stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the, of, of the corner. You see, Peter learned well. You see, he went back to the Old Testament. And he said, I'm going to quote it. Neither, look at verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men. 
whereby we must be saved. Listen to what he said, there's none other. Only way you and I are ever going to uh, get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. So think about it, folks. Think about what Christ has done and is doing in each of our lives here this morning. 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 11 and 12, and this is New Living uh, uh, Translation. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. This is what Paul's writing to young Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, you know what we went through. But God rescued me. You see, I'm convinced God's rescued every one of us from circumstances, situations in our lives, whether you've acknowledged it or not. God's hand has been upon your life at some point in time, and He's continually upon us. You don't know what God has protected you and I from. And he went on, he said, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus will suffer persecution. And I'm going to read one more passage before I close. Just listen to these words. You can turn if you want to later or whatever. I'm reading out of 1 Peter, the third chapter, verse 13. Listen to these words. This is Peter, the same Peter that we're seeing here that stood up before the Sanhedrin court with boldness. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? You see, I'm convinced these men that I gave you an example of, the pastor and the other people, other believers that were there, the reason they had the strength to even give their life for, in the name of Jesus was that they were followers of Christ. They knew him as Lord and Savior. Peter says, and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteous sake, here's what Peter said, when you're suffering for the name of Jesus, happiness will come upon you. I'll give you strength. And it's not afraid of their terror. Folks, there's a lot of terror and a lot of things going on in this old world. There's things, folks, that we have no idea and could, and could only imagine what is happening to believers across this world. Where do they find the strength to stand for Jesus when the world says, forget him and live? What the world doesn't take into account in this life in comparison to what Jesus Christ is offering us is, is in eternity is such small, so small in comparison. And what the world is offering us is going to be temporary. You see, rulers and doctrines and those that stand, they're, they're gone. Caiaphas, they're gone. He's gone. Annas, all the others. Uh, if they didn't come to know Jesus Christ, they had the opportunity. Look with me. Let's listen a little further in verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Sanctify Him in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. These men that I told, we opened up about, they certainly indeed, they were prepared to give an answer of whom they serve. Peter and John were ready to give an answer to the Sanhedrin court. Having a good conscience that whereas they spoke evil of you as of evildoers, yes, Sanhedrin court speaking evil of them, uh, held them in custody, wanted to intimidate them, wanted to take wipe the name of Jesus Christ off their minds and hearts, that that name would never again flow off, will flow from their lips. He would have nothing to do with that. In this little segment in, in 1 Peter, Peter closes with this. For it is better if the will of God be so than you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You be sure, folks, 
you're with Jesus, that you're following Christ completely and totally in your heart and mind and soul. You see, there was something different about Peter and John. The Holy Spirit, Christ, was walking and right there with them, fortifying them. Not just there, just in presence, but in his power. And in Peter's life, and in John's life and the other disciples and other believers, they were empowered by Jesus Christ. They were with Christ. They walked with Christ. I pray every person here today that you're walking with Jesus Christ in the way and manner in which that Christ finds pleasing today. But also know that, uh, that sometimes we try to get to heaven through simply mentally got to be deeper than that folks the devil knows Christ the devil knows who Christ is and the devil's not going to be in heaven the devil is there and he knows about him but he has not allowed Christ to be Lord of his life and Savior of, the, of his or her life I encourage you here today let your life speak with boldness not arrogance, but with boldness in the name of Jesus Christ. Let your steps be walk, be taken with the boldness of Jesus Christ. Just as Peter and John, they were not afraid. They would stand toe to toe with the same men that would take Christ and took him a few weeks earlier. And now they would stand toe to toe and they would recognize them. If you read a little further in Acts, the fourth chapter, that they were uneducated and they were, they were amazed and marveled at who they were. But they stood at the name of Jesus. What are you standing on today, folks? As a believer of Jesus Christ, are you standing where you need to stand? Is the Holy Spirit empowering you with His presence? And are you thinking and allowing God's will to be done with every step that you take and every word that you utter? Is Christ Lord? Peter and John were not the same. They were changed and they were transformed by the power and the presence of Jesus. That's why they were able to stand toe to toe with those that were in authority. Because they were Jesus Christ, they were standing with Christ. I know most of us that are listening to my voice today, at least I hope and pray that most of us, you know Christ as Lord and Savior, and there's no doubt. That's a wonderful thing to know Christ. But if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we need to talk and let me pray with you, and let me show you how to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. How to receive just exactly what we see in, in Peter and John's life, and the other disciples and early believers, and the early church, what brought them that power? What changed in that short period of time? It was none other than Christ. And Jesus is offering the very same thing in every one of yours in my life. And he's saying, open up your heart and life to me. Let me be Lord of your life. I want to be part of your life. I don't want to be just part of it. Sometimes, at certain times in your life, when you get in bad fixes, I don't want to be just there then. Jesus said, I want to walk with you every day, every moment of your life, every hour, every minute, with every breath that you take. I want it to be Jesus. Where do you find the strength? You can't find it anywhere other than in Jesus Christ. And most of us, as we are children of the Lord, I encourage you, if you're here today and, and maybe you know that I could have walked closer to the Lord and I could have made better decisions. Maybe I need to rededicate or I need to recommit my life to Him. Folks, there's no better time right now. Peter and John knew that right now was the time to stand up for Jesus. We sing that beautiful hymn, hymn Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. I want to challenge every one of us to stand up for Jesus. You stand up for him. So if you're here this morning, you need to rededicate or recommit your life. Bow with me here. And those at home, please bow with me if you would, please. If you're here or listening to us here today, 
and you need to rededicate or recommit your life in the name of Jesus. Maybe you felt weak. Maybe you sometimes or maybe just felt like, I don't know what direction I'm going in. Maybe you've taken your eyes off Christ. Jesus is saying, I want to change your life here this morning. I want to empower you with my boldness. And I want it to be an intense. Because listen, folks, this whole world needs the intensity of the boldness of Christ. If you want to rededicate or recommit your life, you slip up your hand right now as a child of God. As you raise your hand, whether you're listening at home and you're ready to recommit your life and say, Jesus, I need your boldness this day. Or if there's somebody here that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will you just lift up your hand and say, I need to know Christ. For He is where that boldness is to be found. And at home, please do that same thing. Father, I come before you here this morning. I thank you, Lord, for your presence. I thank you, Lord, for the account in your Holy Scripture of Jesus' chosen disciples, of us being seen, shown the, what a difference the Holy Spirit, the power of your presence in their lives, what a difference it made. And Lord, I've seen others throughout history that have, been, have, have stood on that solid rock, Lord, that you are and have refused to turn their back on you. And they've given their life, this whole earthly life, they've given it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for that determination. I thank you for that courage, Lord, that it shows us. And Lord, I pray that every person that is listening to my voice at this time, Lord, that they're hearing you and that you're willing to give them that same power and that same presence and that same boldness. Oh, Father, speak to us. And Lord, heal, forgive the sins that are in our lives. Give us that new direction. Give us that new strength that we need that will draw us closer to you and to one another. Oh, Lord, hear our prayers this day. Hear the concerns of our heart. And we'll always give you honor, glory for everything that you do. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. May God bless you. At this time, we want to say goodbye to those that are online. We're glad that you're with us. Please uh, uh, come back and be with us once again. We're glad to have you as part of the Austin Grove family listening to us. May God bless you. And to each of you here in the sanctuary, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. And may God take care of you and put that hedge protection around you. God bless you.